on a topic of the topic of fasting. So uh, we're going to do it tonight, and then we're going to do it next week as well. I think the uh, topic of fasting is uh, really timely because we are in the season of fasting. At least uh, there's some religions of the world that are fasting in this season. One is the Muslim world, and uh, they do uh, something called Ramadan. And that um, began April 2nd, and it goes through May 2nd. And they fast every day through that time. They have an evening meal after a fast for the day. And then there's one other group of people that some of you are very familiar with that fast as well, and that's the Catholic environment. Uh, some of you grew up in that. I did. And there are certain things that they do during that season. Um, Good Friday is a place where no meat is eaten. In fact, I think most of the Fridays, I think they don't eat meat. Um, and then they have this thing where they give up certain things for Lent, right? You remember Lent starts on um, Ash Wednesday, and it goes through what they call Holy Thursday. And um, I remember growing up uh, doing that. And, of course, the whole idea was, what are you going to give up? And, um, oh, you know, things like, I think I'm going to give up beer. <laughs> I'm going to give up chocolate. You know, all the hard things in life, right? Um, growing up in Pecos, I gave up skydiving. <laughs> that was an easy one because we don't skydive. But um, you'll, you'll see also people going to uh, Chimayo, right, walking uh, uh, the walk there. And part of that is, again, uh, that whole idea of fasting and uh, things that they do because they want to get ready for Easter. Well, uh, I thought, how timely. This morning, I don't know if you guys read this news feed, but it read this way. I want you to listen really carefully. Chicago Church fasting from whiteness. Did you see that, John? During Lent by ditching hymns written by white people. And then the statement, this is the thing that got me. Listen to the statement of what they used for their justification. They said this, for Lent is our prayer, Lent, it is our prayer that in our spiritual disciplines we may grow as Christians united in the body of Christ with people of all ages, nations, faces, and origins. I guess except the white people. <laughs> that is an oxymoron, right? Yeah. Written by morons, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what, the, what it is. Um, but I thought how, how interesting as we, be, we come to the season of our time as a church to talk about um, fasting. Well, that is why it's important. There's a whole lot of confusion out there about what fasting is all about, and this study is going to be divided into really two sections. Tonight, our goal is to find out what the Bible says about fasting. It's going to be kind of a real uh, big overview on fasting of the Scripture, how fasting fits into the believer's life, because it does fit into the believer's life, and then we're going to hopefully clear up some misconceptions about fasting, which I think are really important. And then next week as we meet, we're going to talk about how do you implement fasting into your life. It's not enough, as you know, anytime you come to service, it is definitely not enough to get information, right? You take the information, God convicts you of what you need to do, and then you change. You apply the information for transformation in your life. And so our hope is, as we meet, we're not only going to listen and see what God has to say about fasting, but we want to implement that, both on an individual basis as well as a corporately as a church, and I think that's really important. So why, why, the, why the topic of fasting? Why should we even consider that? First of all, it's biblical. We need to know it's biblical. That's very, very important. But secondly, I think you'd all agree we're living in some very interesting times, would you say? There's a whole lot of concern that's going on, a lot of anxiety. There's a whole lot of fear. There's a lot of uncertainty of what's happening in the future. And I think as we look at all these things that are going on, we also understand that we are also in the end times, right? And we're uh, without excuse. We are without excuse as knowing what's going to happen. The world may be with excuse, but we know as believers things are going to heat up, right? Uh, for those people who think things are going to get better and better, I think they are um, living in a fantasy land. We know from the scriptural base that things are going to heat up. And so because of that, I think it's such an important time that we gather together as a church and really move our prayer life now to a different level. And we're going to see how that happens over the next few weeks. 
What we want to do before we do that, we want to come to, to, uh, together as the body of Christ, and we want to spend some time in worshiping our God. Uh, we're so thankful that we can lift our voices to him. What a, what a joy it is, and what a joy it is to come together corporately. I hope you're worshiping God on an individual basis. I hope there's times in your day when you do that. But one of the things that you see in Scripture, there's a lot of things that are going to end here on earth. Church is eventually going to end, by the way. Did you know that? Yeah, eventually church is going to end. Uh, preaching is going to end, by the way, one of these days. But the one thing that remains is worship. When you look at the book of Revelation, the one kind of common thing you see in the book of Revelation is that there's continual worship for all eternity. And so we have that privilege of doing that today. As we worship, I want you to remember that uh, as we come together and sing, um, this is never, ever any kind of performance. In fact, there's only one audience we have. It's an audience of one, right? An audience of one. And so when we lift our voices, I, I want you to think about the words we're singing, and I hope they minister to you. There's lots of ways that the Word of God is presented. And one of the ways it's presented is through music. And uh, I'm so thankful for the people who have been gifted to write music and to put words in a, such a way that can move our hearts close to the heart of God. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you that we can bless you, God, as we come together. Your joy, God, is to see your people honoring you and thanking you. And that's what we're here for this evening. You're so faithful, God, so good. We thank you, God, for our salvation, just thinking of the way you brought us into the kingdom and the numbers of people you brought into our life, those faithful witnesses that pointed us to the Savior. Thank you for each of them those ones we've even forgotten, those passing words that were given to us, those uh, examples of what a Christian should be. Thank you, God, for them. And we thank you above all, God, for your Holy Spirit for waking us up. As your scripture says, God, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And your Holy Spirit, God, as John writes, has come to wake us up to the truth. And we pray now, Father, as we worship you in song, that your, your name would just absolutely be blessed. Thank you, God, for the Savior. And God, we pray now that as we come together, God, we're preparing right now, even now, for resurrection someday. As we come together as a fellowship to absolutely, God, rejoice. Not only in Christ did on the cross, but more importantly, that he rose again from the dead that we could have eternal life. We thank you, Father, these things in Jesus' name.
thank you so much for you. Thank you for this day, for every breath that we take, God. Thank you that your mercies are new every single morning, God. Thank you that even though we face many trials throughout the day, Lord, that we get to be here today and just worship you and have so much hope in you, God, because this world is hopeless and you are our anchor. And we just thank you and we worship you and you place so much joy in our hearts, God, no matter the trials that we're going through, Lord. And it doesn't make sense to the world, but it makes sense to us. And we, we love you, God. This is for you.
Father God, it's a privilege to be here as one body to recognize who you are, God of the universe, Savior of our souls, and the one that shows us how to live this life in a way that we can find joy and peace and love and all the things that we really truly desire. God, I pray that you would just reveal to us through your word what do we need to do to get closer to you? Because the closer we get to you, the more life makes sense. You are a good God, and we thank you.
the one person we can rely upon whenever it feels like we're all alone and everyone has left us. Or whenever we don't know which way to go, you always show us where we need to be. Thank you.
so grateful we can raise our voices to you. How refreshing it is to sing praises to you. We pray, God, that these would be words in our hearts just resonating in heaven. And God, you remind us that you, you embody, you come here in the essence of praises of your people. Thank you, Father, for tonight as we can gather as a body of believers to really look to you right now, God, as our King and our Savior and really our everything. We pray your Holy Spirit, God, to come and just bless your people right now. The things that are on each heart, God, that come up to you on a daily basis. We pray, in God, for your your comfort for those who are hurting, for healing for those who need healing. And we're grateful, Father, for the hope, God, you give us as we consider your scripture, God, in the midst of chaos and tragedy and all the incredible things we're seeing unveil. For us, God, the best is yet to come. And we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name. My stepmom, Lori, is here tonight. Um, <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> Sorry. And my dad. Um, and she's going to have surgery tomorrow. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in um, February, I think, or January. And um, so she has a surgery tomorrow. And I just thought it was a beautiful opportunity. Um, to pray for her. This surgery has been rescheduled twice already. This is, this is her third time being scheduled with this surgery. So I just thought it was such a God thing and for them to be here this night in Santa Fe. And I wanted them to come to hear the worship and just here to church. So I just wanted all of us to pray for her right yeah. now. I was going to ask if Larry, if you could uh, lead us in prayer. They're back in the back. Could you raise your hand? There you go. There they are. Larry, Ray, can you go pray with them? We'll pray with you, okay? Thank you, Father.
And that's what the body of Christ is about, right? That's exactly what it's about. So we want to consider again the, uh, the whole issue of fasting. And um, I was thinking about this particular topic. And when it comes to uh, certain topics uh, taught in, in the church, from the pulpit, there's uh, a few topics that make people kind of squirm every now and then, um, become defensive. Um, there's two that I know. One for sure is tithing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm so thankful that in this fellowship, that is not the emphasis. Um, the heart of this church is that as God ministers to you through his word, as you become obedient to his word, out of that is an outflow of thankfulness, and part of that is giving of what God has given to you. But um, every now and then, there are certain churches who believe that's kind of an emphasis, so they have the wrong um, perspective. But I'm so thankful for the perspective in this church. But the other one is also fasting. Um, and it's because often there's a, a, an expectation that the person presenting the topic wants something from you. And I guess what tonight what I want to do is rest, uh, have you rest assured that when we consider this topic of fasting, there's not going to be any expectations or burdens put upon you. That's really important. And the only agenda we have tonight is really to clarify the teaching uh, from the scripture relative to this idea of fasting and how fasting fits into your life as a believer of Jesus Christ. So how does fasting fit into the life of an average believer? Can I tell you, it doesn't for the most part. It doesn't. We live in a country that is really um, a place where food has become an obsession for many. We have uh, landscapes dotted the shrines of the golden arches, right? And pizza temples everywhere, yeah? Did you know there's uh, over a million food channels on YouTube? A million food channels on YouTube, not on regular channels, but in YouTube. And the fasting, <laughs> the fasting seems really to be out of place. Uh, and out of step with our times, but can I tell you, it wasn't out of step and out of times in the Scripture. When you look at the Old Testament, you look at the New Testament, fasting was really part of the believer's life. And since fasting was a commonplace, here's a question we need to ask. Why isn't it mentioned more in, in churches? Since, since it's common, why isn't it mentioned? Let me give you some reasons why I think it isn't mentioned. First of all, fasting is an emotional subject. And it um, has some extreme views. You have some people who believe that it's completely out of place in today's church. And you have the other extreme who believe that if you're not fasting, you're not saved. So there's some extreme views on this. So that's one of the reasons I think it's not taught. People want to stay away from the particular topic. The other thing is that food is a very personal matter. <laughs> um, many uh, live to eat <laughs> rather than eat to live. <laughs> And so, and it's true. I mean, uh, you, when you talk about somebody's food, they get a little uptight about that whole issue of fasting. But here's the one thing I think that is most significant is uh, biblical ignorance is what it is. And also biblical indifference, indifference. So let's begin with our approach on this whole thing. I think it's important to lay down a foundation. Now, th this isn't like a, a, a definition found in the scripture, but it's kind of gathered from the scripture. And I think you have to start with what is truly biblical fasting. So I, I wrote this out. A biblical fast, and you, you want to hold on to this as we go through the next couple of weeks. A biblical fast is a non-compulsory, voluntary abstinence from food to humble oneself before God when facing a spiritual struggle or a spiritual purpose. And we're going to look at that as time goes on because we're going to give you some examples of how fasting took place in the, both the Old and New Testament and its purposes as well. So having a definition of what fasting is, when you have that down, then you know what fasting is not, right? Let me tell you what fasting is not. Fasting is not to look better physically <laughs> and, and to have a better mental outlook. Some people look at that. And by the way, in, from the world standpoint, they do that, right? Fasting is very significant relative to better physique, better physical outlook, and so on. Um, I can tell you, I looked up um, how many places and how many sites there are for the Daniel Fast. Do you guys remember the Daniel Fast? Anybody remember that movement? It was around uh, 10, 15 years ago. I don't know, a while, a while back. 
unbelievable numbers of books on the Daniel fast. They go to Daniel, the book of Daniel, and find out how he fasted, if you remember. And it says that at the end of the fast, they look what? Healthier than the rest of them, right? And so they took that and they began to make that almost a theology. So that, that's one of the things that fasting is not for. It's not to look better physically than be mentally more astute. It's also not a spiritual weight program, <laughs> a holy diet. It's not a holy diet. <laughs> I mean, you may lose some weight, but that's not its purpose. It is not a way to force God to answer prayer. People will do that to say, you know what, if I fast God, you owe me, right? If you, they do. They, come, they will do that. Here's another one. This is really significant in church. Fast is not a sign of spirituality, a superior spirituality. Why do I tell you that? It's the same issue that you hear sometimes in churches who are really bent on the gifts of the Spirit and especially the speaking in tongues. You've heard that before. We've all been around that stuff. That whole idea that if you don't speak in tongues, therefore you haven't reached that spirituality that we have reached who speak tongues. Same thing with fasting. There's people who are involved in fasting and they'll ask you, do you fast? You say, no. Well, you know, all of a sudden, they'll let you know why you're not as spiritual as you should be. Here's the last one. It's not a method to save, save money due to inflation. <laughs> In today's world, there are some people that are actually going to be doing that. And it's unfortunate because they're having to cut back on certain things really just to meet uh, ends meet. But that's not what biblical fasting is about. So here's what we, we can look at now. Once you get a, a biblical definition of what fasting is about, we can answer the first and foremost question we need to ask. Here's the first and foremost questions, the question we need to ask. Are Christians commanded in the Bible to fast? That's an important question, don't you think? Are Christians commanded, commanded in the Bible to fast? Here's the answer. No, they're not commanded. There's only one command in the scripture for fasting. And that was given to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, found in Leviticus chapter 16 and Leviticus chapter 23. It was done at the Day of Atonement, which we call Yom Kippur. So fasting was part of that whole perspective of that feast. And what in, was involved with that was really kind of a, a time when people would come and it would be a time of deep and mournful confession of sin. And I, I want you to think about that carefully because that's really part of what fasting we're going to be looking at next week because there's purposes for fasting, biblical purposes for fasting that we want to look at next week. It gives us a clue again of what fasting is about. By the way, when you read in Leviticus and uh, chapter 11, I mean, 16 and 23. They don't use the word fast, they use the word affliction. So when you see it, you go, I can't find the word fasting. It's being afflicted. They use that particular word to describe fasting. But this took place, and it was involved with both men and women. By the way, it's involved with children as well. Children had to fast. It lasted usually from sun up to sundown. And it really is a place, again, for people to come together looking to God, mainly at this time in the Day of Atonement, for confession of sin both corporately as a nation as well as uh, individually. Well, the Bible uh, does command believers to do certain things, right? We are commanded to pray, true? Commanded to pray not only once, twice, but what? Unceasingly, right? We're actually commanded to give as well. To give and to give and to give, right? That's part of who we should be, right? We're just like... We're created in God's image, and God is a giver. Don't you think? He's a great giver. But it never commands us to fast. Now, the reason I tell you this and emphasize this, there are some people who are going to tell you it is a command. I think you need to know from the scriptural basis that it is not, because they have other reasons why they want to command you to fast. And it usually has to do with money, usually, or a book they're going to sell. So just be very wary of that. Well, since, since, com since believers are not commanded to fast... Here's the other questions, a few questions we need to ask tonight. Is fasting an important spiritual discipline in the life of a believer? That's an important question. Is it important? Not only is it in the scripture, but is it an, impo is it an important um, spiritual discipline? Well, one way you can evaluate how important it is, is really simply look at the people who fasted in the scripture. There are some incredible names of those who fast, it's like a who's who in the Bible. I think I listed them up there, but I'll go through them with you. There was Moses. First of all, it's, I think it's the first 
fast that's recorded in, in Exodus chapter 34. We're going to look at that in the, in the next week. There's Moses. He fasted for 40 days. And by the way, a 40-day fast, I probably wouldn't encourage you to do that. <laughs> that is called a supernatural fast. And I believe that the only way that can happen is when God intervenes in an, in an unbelievable way. But there was Moses who fasted. Uh, others who fasted. Samson, Samuel, Saul, Hannah, Jonathan, David, Elijah, Nehemiah, King Jehoshaphat, Ezra, Daniel. Man, these are some big heavy hitters, don't you think? I want you to look at them because these are not your ordinary people walking through life with God. These are people who had a really heart for God, did incredible things for God. And these are people who fasted. In the New Testament, we know John the Baptist fasted. There was Anna in Luke chapter 2. The prophets and teachers in Antioch, before they chose the people they wanted to send out, Paul and Barnabas, they said they came together and they fasted. The apostle Paul fasted, and actually in Acts 14.23, uh, it says that it was common in every church. Ah, I thought that was a very interesting passage to say again that this was not, again, isolated just to a few people, but it was a common practice that took place in the early church. And when they had ordained all the elders in the church, they prayed and they fasted and they commended them to the Lord in whom they believed. So we can see that the, the importance of fasting is seen by those people who made an incredible impact uh, for God in, in history. But I think more importantly, we need to know what Jesus thought about fasting, don't you think? I think that's like really, really important. Both Matthew and Luke record Jesus' 40-day uh, fast. Remember when he was tempted in the wilderness? And the reason I bring that up, because that's going to be another area we're going to be looking at of reasons to fast. We're talking about spiritual warfare. We're going to look at that next week. And then the thing that's really, I think, really significant is in Matthew chapter 6, where we've been studying the disciples' prayer. As soon as he gets done talking about that, he moves into fasting and actually addresses fasting because it was being abused, like so many things that Jesus had to deal with. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, Jesus affirms fasting as a commonplace, because I want you to listen to the words that he used. He said this in verse 16. Moreover, and this is what he says, when ye fast, be not like the hypocrites. And then verse 17, he said, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head with oil and wash thy face. Now, the reason I want you to look at this, because twice he uses the word when, right? And when you use the word when, it implies that it is what? Being done. So you see Jesus affirming the practice of fasting. We also see Jesus' position on fasting in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 through 17. This is an interesting passage. The disciples of John come and they're with the Pharisees as well. And they confront Jesus on the issue of fasting by asking this question. They say, why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, often, but thy, the, but thy disciples fast not? You know, when I looked at that passage, the first thing I thought is people are watching, <laughs> right? People are watching your life. It's one thing to know the scripture. It's one thing to be able to understand the scripture. But let me tell you, when you leave the doors here, people are watching your life. They're observing how you live. Well, often as Jesus did, when he was asked a question, he answered with a question. And by the way, that's a great teaching tool. Did you know that? To, to get people to engage, to think. Because people want an answer, don't they? They, they, want, they ask a question, they want an answer, but they don't want to think about what the, the process of getting the answer. They just want the answer. It's a great way to help people engage in finding the answer and, and guiding them through it. But Jesus answers them the question. And in verse 9, verse, uh, uh, Matthew 9, 15, he says this, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? No fasting. Why? Because no fasting during the wedding. Um, you guys ever been to a wedding where they say there's no food? <laughs> not in northern New Mexico. Elsewhere maybe, but not in northern New Mexico. And if you can't, by the way, if you can't make the wedding, here's what you tell people. Fix me a plate. <laughs> now, some of you didn't grow up here. You don't get it. But those of you who grew up here know exactly what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> By the way, when Jesus says, um, we're not fasting because the bridegroom's here, he, he didn't imply that fasting was inherently improper. And neither did he denounce those who were fasting. Instead, Jesus viewed their fast taking place, look, at, at the wrong time. It was at the wrong time. And he asked John's disciples, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's still with them? That was not a time to fast. That was a time to feast, right? <laughs> if Jesus is with you, you don't fast at that time. You feast. Because the answer is really obvious. There's no fasting because the wedding is a time to feast. And Jesus speaks of his ascension when he is going to heaven. He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. And then they shall fast. Then they shall fast. In other words, fasting will continue until his return. And so we do fast until our Lord comes back. We're, we're living in the period of time when the bridegroom is taken from us. We know from John. Remember John says, Jesus tells him, I go away to prepare a place for you. Remember that? But I will come back. Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was not the first one to say that, right? I'll, re <laughs> I'll be back. No, he wasn't the first one. But there's going to be a time, I love this, because the Scripture tells us there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we're going to feast with the Lord one more time. So once we establish that fasting is a spiritual discipline established in the New Testament and affirmed by Jesus, here's the key. How do we administer it? How do we administer fasting? In other words, how is a fast to be done, right? That, that's an important question. How do you do it? Here, you've got to listen to this real carefully. Apart from the instruction on fasting given to the nation of Israel, apart from that, the Bible offers no structure on how believers are to fast. There's no structure for it. We find fasts in the Bible that are done corporately. There's a great one we're going to be looking at next week because it's got some really wonderful biblical principles. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. King Jehoshaphat calls a national fast. And why does he do that? Because enemies are <laughs> bearing down on them. And he calls the whole nation. He says, man, we need to fast and we need to pray because we are in trouble. Good reason to fast, right? Are we in trouble today? Yes. We ought to be fasting, don't you think? I think we should. We're going to talk about reasons. So we think, oh, I don't know what I should fast for. Next week, you're going to have no excuse. <laughs> so eat up. <laughs> <laughs> you remember Esther um, the whole scenario that happens where an edict goes out that uh, the Jews are going to be annihilated remember and Esther calls for a nationwide fast and the Jews fast because of the decree for their annihilation the book of Jonah I love that one the thing that's so interesting about that is that all of the city fasted including the animals <laughs> That was a serious fast, right? <laughs> you and the animals. And why, why, why did they fast? Because of the impending judgment. Impending judgment. There's another good reason to fast, don't you think? Is there an impending judgment coming? Oh, yes, there is, right? Yes, there is. We're going to talk about how we're going to pray and use fasting for that. Acts 13 records a fast involved small groups of people. The prophets and teachers gathered again to minister to the Lord, and they fast fasted to seek direction for setting aside Barnabas and Saul for ministry. It says this, and when they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. And every now and then a pastor wants to lay hands on certain people, but it's, <laughs> it's when they're bad people. No, he's not going to lay hands on them. <laughs> um, most commonly, when you look at the scripture, uh, the types of fasts that take place are usually individual fasts. The one I love is Nehemiah. Now, what a great chapter that is. So Nehemiah is having a wonderful time in uh, Susa. You know, he's got a, a choice job. Now, um, things go really bad if, the, you know, if, if someone tries to poison, you know, the king. I mean, it's going to be bad news because he's got to drink it first. I mean, we understand that. But apart from that, what a choice job. I mean, he, he was in the palace, best food, best entertainment, everything. I mean, he, 401k to the max, right? Gym membership, the whole thing. He had, he had it all. Enjoying a good life, understood that there's problems going on in Jerusalem, but he wasn't really uh, in tune with that. 
until some people came and said, you really need to understand what's going on. It's bad news that's going on. They came and they told him and said, the, there's great affliction and reproach taking place in Jerusalem. And that whole idea of affliction and reproach was two things, actually. The affliction was uh, the, the, the things that are going on with the nation of Israel, the people themselves being hurt in, in all kinds of different ways. But the reproach was different. He's saying, you understand, you need to understand what's going on in Jerusalem. God's name is taken in vain. This place should not be trashed like this. This is God's city, holy city. And when, when he finally grabs a hold of it, I believe the Holy Spirit just absolutely grabbed a hold of Nehemiah, made him understand what was really going on. Verse 4 says this, He sat down and wept, and he mourned for days and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. I think of our country right now. We are a reproach to the world. And there's incredible affliction taking place. How does it move us? Or, or should it move us at all? It should move us, right? Not just arguing politics. Politics don't solve anything, right? I hope you guys know that. <laughs> doesn't matter you vote in. They're all sinners. And they all have different perspectives. Pray for them, obviously. There's not enough laws to be passed that could ever fix this country. You can't legislate light righteousness. You can't do it. That's what God proved in the Old Testament, didn't he? In fact, he did it in Genesis. <laughs> he just said, you just got to keep one law. And then 10 laws. And then hundreds of laws. You can't do it. But God can do it. Jesus can do it. A changed life can do it. Right? The fast was due to an assault on God's work and God's people. Another great reason to fast. Well, two final questions that we're going to look at to address before we close this section. And here's the first one. What should be the length of the fast? That's important, right? When you, when you think about fasting, what's the length of the fast? Well, what we find in the Scripture is it varied again. There's no structure for it. It, it varied tremendously. The longest fasts were done by Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, 40 days. That's a supernatural fast. And it would be a, a wonderful study to find out exactly what, how they connect with each other. There's reasons for that. Daniel fasted for three weeks. Um, that's a long fast. In Acts chapter 9, verse 9, Paul fasted for three days. He, he fasted. It says he was blinded and he fasted. I was thinking he couldn't see where the food was. <laughs> so he, he didn't eat. No, that's not what happened. Luke chapter 18, verse 12, records how the Pharisees fasted twice a week. We're going to look at that next week. That is so significant, that passage. And we're going to see why they declared a two-day fast. But the most common fast was from sun up to sunset. The length of the fast, listen, should be Holy Spirit led. That's where it should be. Holy Spirit led. And by the way, an, an, aware, an awareness of your own body. Okay? We never want to see somebody go comatose here <laughs> because they're fasting. If you've got a blood sugar issue, especially blood sugar, you have to be very careful with that. And you may even want to even talk to your doctor about fasting. God, God knows your heart, and if you're not capable of doing it, you know, God understands. Don't feel like you're less than. You know what's unfortunate is that fasting became a real big deal probably about five years ago, I think. I don't know when it was. And all of a sudden, that's all I heard from churches about this fasting that was taking place. And you know what it turned into? A competition. It, it really did. It turned into a competition, kind of a spiritual contest is what it was. Uh, you know, kind of the measurement, again, of spirituality, promoting that the longer the fast, the more spiritual a person. And in the process, listen, in the process, they lost total, total purpose of the fast. Became another religious thing to do, right? Another religious thing to do, rather than the purpose of why we do what we do. Well, here's one last question. How frequent 
And how often should a believer fast? You know what? Just like the length, the length of your fast, the frequency also depends on how the Holy Spirit is going to move you to fast. And really, what is the spiritual condition you're in? I think that's really significant. This is very interesting. In, in 2 Corinthians 11.27, Paul speaks of fastings often. Fastings often. He didn't say often. He said, he says, I fasted often. Now, why fasting often? It's because Paul was in constant spiritual struggle. I don't, I'm talking about his, well, part of it is probably his, some of the things he had to deal with himself. But he was struggling with a lot of interesting spiritual conditions in the church, right? You, re, you read the epistles, oh my goodness, nothing's really changed. The, the stuff that churches go through, all the things he had to deal with. And so because of that, he looked to God and said, God, I need something here, and the way I'm going to meet with you, I'm going to fast. It was part, again, of dealing with the things that he was involved with, the spiritual conditions, both personally as well as his ministry. So how often you fast is going to be dependent on your own spiritual struggles and spiritual condition. And I would say that if you're really honest, really honest, You'll be fasting because your spiritual condition needs to change. <laughs> and the spiritual struggles we're in are significant. You guys have loved ones that aren't saved? Is that a reason to fast for them? Do you care for them? Judgment's coming for them. You should be fasting for them, right? Praying and saying, God, speak to me how I can minister to them. We'll go look at that next week. So when should you start fasting? Tonight. <laughs> no. See, most of you are thinking, yeah, I won't eat when I go home and I'll just break fast in the morning. <laughs> no. Can I encourage you to think about starting right away? Well, nobody's going to force you to do it. No one's even going to ask you if you fasted. I hope, no one, I hope no one asks anyone about their fasting. I really hope they don't. But I would encourage you to do it. Start with one meal. Can we deal with that one meal? Oh, I think we can. I think we could. And use that time to get alone with God and really seek Him. And God's going to put on your heart some of the things you really need to bring before Him. And it's not just, again, when we pray, I want you to really grab a hold of this. It's not a one-way conversation. We come to God and we speak to Him but God wants to speak to you. And I think one of the ways that God's going to speak to you most clearly is when you're fasting. You're going to be attuned to that. And if you forget what you're doing, your stomach's going to tell you why you're doing it. <laughs> It'll remind you why you're doing it. And I believe God's going to transform not only this church to move it to a higher ground, ascent, right? Move upward. God never wants us to stay where we're at. He didn't say, tell us again, John, what is it? God didn't save you, save you? This far to keep you, that's right. That's the one. He, want, he wants to move us up. And I really believe the times we live, fasting is that time right now. This is it. And so we're going to talk about how we're going to incorporate this corporately. And, and corporately is going to be pretty simple. There's going to be things that are going to come up in this church that we need people to seriously fast and pray for. Can I tell you one of them right away? Our children's ministry. Our children's ministry. I hope you're seeing and listening to what's going on in the world with our kids. The tragedy that's going on in schools. The things that are being taught. Even the magic kingdom, above all, oh my goodness, what they're doing there. It's an assault on our children at three years of age. You need to be praying and fasting and minister to our kids here. Man, what, these are precious souls that God has brought into this church. A haven that God has given. You don't have to, have to go out and find kids. God's bringing kids. And you have an opportunity to minister to them. Can I ask you to pray and fast? God wants to use you in children's ministry. 
and other ministries in the church, right? It's not the only one, but other ministries. We're going to have an opportunity now to spend time together to pray like we have. And there's probably things on your heart you need to pray for. Maybe you want to share some things with your group. That's great. There's definitely things here in the church you can pray for. Think of all the ministries God has brought up. Thank God for all the things he's doing, right? What incredible things God has done in this fellowship, what he's doing, the things that we're seeing happening. Incredible things, wonderful things. Pray for the city. Pray for the state, the nation. Pray for the things going on in the world. Pray for what's going on in the Ukraine. The the scenes that you're seeing on TV are just, I don't know how you guys feel, but oh, man, my heart just breaks when I see that. The tragedy. Because of the sinfulness of man. It's not politics. Bottom line, it's always the sinfulness of man. And the only thing that cures that, fixes that, is the gospel of Christ. Amen? Let's go ahead and gather together. Maybe groups of six, eight, ten, whatever. And let's go ahead and spend some time.